always, 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 it comes back to childhood. You can give me anything that someone's struggling with. On some level, there's something in childhood that set up a belief or a program or there was a trauma that's impacting the way that we're showing up now. Five to seven percent of what we say, what we react, even how we feel and respond is conscious. The rest is subconscious. It's, it's programming, it's patterning, it's habits. The reparenting piece of it is about going back and giving ourselves the parenting we didn't have then now. The purpose of inner child work is not going back and reliving your trauma. It's more giving the inner child the opportunity to feel and express what they never got to express around it. Evolution is about like having these challenges and healing from them. Really asking, what did I learn from them? Not carrying around the trauma and the beliefs and the anger. So this particular episode is really interesting because it's about getting all that you want in life. Christine's podcast is called Get Over It and Get On With It. And the get on with it, she's been a coach for almost 20 years. She's a master coach. She's incredible at what she does. And yet in this conversation, we go deep into the key thing that is holding most people back from getting on with it, from achieving the life of their dreams. And it's surprising just what's waiting for us to look at deep within ourselves that's actually holding us back. I think this is a really incredible conversation. If you tune in, I think you'll think so too. Hey guys, as we're getting started, just, yeah, if you could do me a massive honor, please do hit subscribe. Every single subscription helps so much. The greater the subscriptions on the channel, the bigger the guests become, the bigger the platform becomes, and we're championing positivity here. Means that, you know, the algorithmic, overlordic sort of stuff knows that this is the kind of content that we want to see more and more of online so we can promote positivity, help it go more and more viral online. So please take a sec to subscribe. I'll appreciate you forever. Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us today, Inspiring Our Evolution, Christine Hassler. How are you, Christine? I'm great. Thank you. Oh, it is such a pleasure having you here. For those tuning into Christine for the first time, she is a master coach. She has written several books. She's got her own podcast. We're going to talk about it today, how to get over it and get on with it. <laughs> it's going to be a big part of the conversation. Christine, I really wanted to start today with what is your mission in life? Well, I mean, at the the highest level, my mission is just to evolve and to return to love, as Marion Williamson would say. Um, I think that the whole purpose of being a human is to remember who we truly are, remember our core essence is love, remember that we are connected, that we belong, we are worthy, deserving, safe, all of that. So my my personal you know, mission is just to remember that, remember I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and how that translates to my professional mission is to help as many people as I can reparent themselves so that they can actually get to those levels of joy and love and creativity and freedom that get to be an amazing part of the human experience. I love that. Let's dive into the word reparenting, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you and why is that the focus of your professional trajectory? Yeah. Well, I've been a coach for nearly 20 years. I started coaching people in 2004 and always, 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 it comes back to childhood. You can give me anything that someone's struggling with and on some level, there's something in childhood that set up a belief or a program or there was a trauma um, that's impacting the way that we're showing up now. So. I'm sure that you've heard and so many of your listeners have heard that only five to seven percent of what we say, what we react, even how we feel and respond is conscious. The rest is subconscious. 
it's, it's programming, it's patterning, it's habits. I'm sure everyone listening can think of something where you've just reacted and you didn't even really think about it. And so the reparenting piece of it is about going back and giving ourselves the parenting we didn't have then now. So as children, and you have a young one, we both have young kids, right? There's no way you'd leave your son for the day and be like, see ya, I'll be back at six. They, <laughs> they, they need us. Our children are completely 1000% dependent on their parents. I think we're the only species, or at least one of the few, that the children are dependent on the parents for so long. So many other species in the animal kingdom, you know, mom's there for a while, but then it's like you're out of the nest metaphorically and literally. And so we're very, very dependent on our primary caregivers and our primary caregivers and what's happening in our childhood, everything from the the culture, religion, or race we grow up in, to the demographic we lived in, to the city, to the language we speak to, the family patterns, everything around us is programming us in some way and is input. And is forming our relationship with ourself, forming how we perceive the world, forming how we believe that we get love or safety or validation, forming what we think we need to be, um, to be accepted in the world. And, no, you know, no pressure to the parents out there, but there's just so much that happens as a child that's out of our control. And as children, we we don't have the sovereignty or maturity or autonomy to go to a father like, hey, dad, you know, you're alcoholic and abusive, and this is really not good for me or my development. So I'm going to go get another dad. Like, no five year old is going to say that. <laughs> what a five year old wants, he doesn't want a different dad. He wants his dad to be different or he wants his dad to love him. So he'll do whatever he has to do to get that dad's love, even though it, it's very unhealthy. And so what happens is we end up as adults, and so much of what happened or didn't happen in childhood is informing who we date what career we chose, what our health is like, so many of our preferences. And we're all kind of looking for something or someone to make us feel a certain way. And most of that craving and yearning is coming from what we didn't get in childhood. You know, if we never felt safe in childhood, we're looking for safety. We we want safety, but we'll be attracted to chaos because that's what we know. You know, if we didn't get any validation in childhood, will constantly be looking for validation, but enough is never enough. And so the the reparenting is about like understanding what that inner child really needs and giving that inner child what they didn't get as a child so that we no longer are making choices from a wounded, wounded inner child place. So let's just give an example. So let's say that dating just doesn't work well for you. Like you, you've done a lot of personal development. Um, you understand your patterns. You understand that you keep being attracted to emotionally unavailable people. And your, your adult rational brain knows like, why do I keep attracting emotionally unavailable people? Or why do I keep attracting narcissists? Like this isn't healthy. You know, I should have seen it coming, but it's actually not your 39 year old self attracted to those people. The five-year-old little girl who had a father like that, who is trying to get what she didn't get from dad from a relationship. And so she's going to be drawn to someone who's similar to dad. Now, rationally, a 39-year-old could go, my dad was a complete narcissist and unhealthy. Why would I ever want that? But again, our rational conscious mind, only five to 7% of our programming. So the reparenting part is going inside And working with that little girl, helping her grieve the father she never had. Side note, I I say on my podcast frequently, there are two deaths of our parents we need to grieve. Their actual physical death when they transition out of the planet and the the death of the ideal. Because there's so many of us that are still turning on to the parent we wish we would have had. And we're looking for it in a romantic partner or a friend or even a boss and when we can actually be with that little one inside and help them grieve, like talk to that five-year-old and say, sweetheart, like daddy's never going to give you what you really desire. But you know what? I, as your adult self can. 
I can make you feel safe. I can make you feel loved. I can make you feel like you belong. And you work with that inner child. And in the, in the inner child work I do with people, we let that inner child cry. We let that inner child have their anger. We let them have their emotions about, in this example, dad not being there, dad being abusive. And we're with them because that's the other thing as children. So often we don't get to have authentic emotional expression and release. You know, even if we have yeah, the most loving shut parents. Down, doesn't it? So yeah, we get shut down because we have to be told you're a good girl or a good boy, or there's already so much chaos in our house and we don't want to add to it. So we just hold everything inside. Or this, the sneaky way this can happen is you can have parents that almost over loved you and were uncomfortable with your emotions and soothed you too quickly. Like I, you know, I have a one and a half year old and I'm really practicing like when she falls and cries or hurts herself, my habitual response is to say, it's okay. You're okay. It's okay. But I've really stopped doing that because in that moment, she's, she's scared and she wants to express and I don't want to stifle that. So I say more, oh, you fell down. Oh, what, you know, did you fall on your knee? Mommy's here, you know, and I really just let her express. Now, if she ever gives me that look like, am I okay? Then I will say, you're okay, you know, and I'll give her that reassurance. But I let her lead that reassurance versus me rushing in and being like, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. And trying to like calm down her expression because I want her to be able to express. And that's just like a micro example, but there's so many times when parents will over-soothe and over-protect. And so it's this dance of really giving our children and then our inner children full permission to have our feelings and have our emotions. So all this is the last thing I'll say because I've been going on for a while. The, no, the, this is fascinating. Yeah, Sorry, I, I interrupted. I said, please don't stop. <laughs> yeah, it's riveting. Um, yeah. The, the reparenting in a nutshell is finding those, um, the, the inner child parts that are wounded, that are kind of frozen in time, that are really running the show subconsciously. And giving them expression, asking them for what they need, connecting to them, and then giving them what they what they need. Um, so, like an example from my life is, like it, um, starting in middle school, I felt very ostracized, like I didn't belong. Um, girls ganged up against me. I was teased and bullied quite a bit. And so, how do you think I was as an adult making friends? Not great because I had a story that people didn't like me. I didn't trust women. P.S. Now I want to run women's retreats. So I've come full circle on this. Um, I just, I had this fear about, you know, belonging and the fear of belonging or not belonging is a huge one because if we look at core human needs, um, they're basically boil. If we boil all the things human needs down to two main things, it's love and safety. Those, those two things and everything else falls in one of those categories. And one of the things that falls under those categories of both love and safety, but especially safety is belonging because we're animals like we are, we're human, but we're animals. And in our like cellular memory, if we didn't belong, we would die because if you didn't belong to a tribe, you would die. You, you need other people. You know, we live in an interdependent universe. So when we feel ostracized, when we feel like we don't belong. It triggers this deep, innate sense of, I might die. Like, how will I survive if I don't belong? So when we have that, we go into like a hyper um, independence, like a hyper, like I'm on my own, like lone wolf type of thing, because we've got to find, we've got to find our way. And so such a big part for me was going back and talking to that 13 year old, letting her have her feelings about it. I'm mad. I'm sad. I'm ashamed. But also, not but, and also really reassuring her and talking to her and saying like, yeah, that wasn't great that they did that. That that really hurt. I can see that. Because a big mistake people make in reparenting or working with the inner child is they give explanation. So the wrong way or the ineffective way, I should say, for me to talk to my 14-year-old would have been, oh, Christine, don't worry. You're going to grow up. You're going to have great friends. You're even going to run women's retreats. Like, you're going to fit in. Like, this is all going to pass. It's just middle school. Oh, 
how does that 13 year old feel completely disregarded? And so I see a lot of people when they're doing reparenting or inner child work, they just give kind of the explanation or like, you know, let's say someone's mom was not very available, not really around, not really nurturing. The adult self may say, oh, little one, you know, your mom, she was going through so much with your dad. She had a really abusive mom. She was struggling with depression. Like she was doing the best she could. Again, the inner child's like, well, that doesn't make me feel any better. That just sounds like we're excusing her. So even though it's great to have perspective and understanding and compassion, we we want to really validate where the inner child is. So really being like, yeah, Christine, that really sucked when you were bullied. That really hurt. Tell me more. And and let the inner child have a voice. And then instead of the explanation, which kind of diminishes the feelings, it's like, okay, what do you need now? What do you need now? How can I help you feel like you belong now? How can you feel connected to me? And, and then that part of us that feels kind of fragmented is like, oh, okay, like it's safe now. I feel heard now. I can let this go now. I, I don't have to stay back here in the past protecting myself. I actually can like integrate into present time. And that's, what, that's how our subconscious stops running the show so much is when we go back in to those places in the subconscious, bring them into conscious awareness, help them integrate so that they're not stuck back there trying to get our attention by sabotaging and picking bad partners and giving us anxiety and all kinds of other things. So I will pause now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for explaining how that looks like. The thing, the, the pertinent question is to ask, how do we identify that, um, inner child work is what we need to do and that it is actually subconscious patterns that are stopping us from achieving ideal outcomes in our life. Like, is it just identifying, actually, I should let you just answer the question. Yeah. I don't think anybody doesn't, that doesn't, it, it applies to everyone. I don't think there's anybody that couldn't use this work on some level or another. And you might say, well, I didn't really have a traumatic childhood. My childhood doesn't impact my life. Well, maybe you've lost your sense of play. Maybe you've lost your sense of creativity or disconnected from it because you've gotten too busy. You know, inner child work isn't just like going back and dealing with trauma and drama. Inner child work is also going back and activating those childlike qualities of authentic expression and magic and creativity and joy and play and all those kinds of things. So I think, I mean, again, I could be making a very bold statement here um, by saying things always come back to childhood and everyone can use this work. Maybe the, I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule. So I'll retract my always statement. Uh, but most <laughs> often the, in what, the, what I have seen in my nearly 20 year career is that mm. everyone can benefit from this work. Truly. How do we then access inner child for the first time? Because I imagine what you described earlier was, yeah, the parent, like even when some of us are parenting our inner child, let's say we're, we're trying that. The, adv the advice that I picked up was don't get left brain logical about it. Try and be as emotionally available to your inner child as possible. Get as right brain about it as you can. Um, you know, don't just say, hey, it's going to be fine. You're going to grow up and you're going to be a superstar. <laughs> so the fact that you're, you know, down in the dumps now is all good. It's like that is so left brain logic. It just, you know, it just yes. completely bypasses. Yes, and especially all to all my Australian friends. Can afford it. Oh, sorry. Now I'm interrupting you. I got excited. No, go on. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, yeah, tell me. Well, so all my Australian friends, because I'm married to an Australian, and I think I'm pretty much Australian because I'm there all the time, and I love Australians. I'm very familiar. I've taught a lot over there. So y'all are excellent at putting the silver lining things. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. All good. Yeah, yeah. You know, like my dad beat the shit out of us, but you know, it's all good now. Oh my gosh, it's such an Australian thing to do to really just like, like it's all right, it's all good, you know, and talk about things that were really hard. Like you're talking about what you had for dinner. And I'm not saying other countries and cultures don't do that, but I see it so prevalent in Australia whenever I go there, I work with an Australian. So it's like you said, it like you were just re-saying, it's so important and paramount to like honor our experience. Now, not be a victim of it and not use our lackluster childhood as an excuse why we don't have what we want. We want to be empowered. 
What I'm talking about is having compassion and awareness and acceptance and giving our childhood the reverence and attention it needs, not going into victim or using it as an excuse to, um, you know, have whatever, not have what we want. So to your question about how we connect with it, you know, it's something that for me, when I first did my inner child work, I needed a guide. I was working with a coach at the time. I was way back in my twenties and I, my early twenties, and she really helped me connect through visualization, through really holding that loving container. Um, this is why I have an inner child course. My, my husband and I teach a, a three-day course on how to really connect deeply with your inner child. And we guide you through all kinds of experiential exercises because it's, it's kind of difficult, not possible, but difficult to just sit there on your own and be like, okay, I'm going to connect with my inner child. And if you have no concept of how to do that, it can feel a little clunky. And for some people, it can kind of feel like you're making it up. And it's like, are you really connecting? But I do have a tip. Yeah, I'm just going to work with a guide. Or you for just one second before, sorry, just just one sec before you, you give your tip, because I really do want your tip. And it's very rude of me to interject. Yeah. But I think no, because okay. what happens when you come across inner child work, it can be so, it's such a concept, it's such an idea that your left brain starts to, again, take over. And it's like, okay, so there's this inner child, there's this little Amrit, I'm going to try and connect with him. And then you're trying to logic your way into it, which in some ways is the exact opposite way of going about it. But yeah, sorry, I just wanted to pepper that in there. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And you're never going to access the inner child through logic. You're never going to get there that way. So I have a tip, and then we can talk a little bit more about how to access it. Um, and I hope my comment about Australians wasn't offensive. It was just what, I, what I've noticed. About. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's literally our saying is, she be right. <laughs> she <Yeah>. be right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, you're absolutely on the money. <laughs> you see all the time, whenever I teach workshops over there, I'm like, come on, y'all. This is a big deal. This happened. Like, let's, <laughs> let's get in there. Um, but anyway, so a quick tip to to start to let me see if I can find mine. I usually have it right on my phone here, but now my phone is so peppered with pictures of my own child that you know my old pictures that I use for my own self have digressed a little bit. Oh, here we go. So I don't know if you can see that. That's oh, me. Yeah, it's little Christine. And that's me. I love little Christine. Um, so that's I keep awesome. that on my phone, and I have a couple pictures of me as a little one on my phone, and that's a great way to start. Just get some pictures. And I know some people may not have access to themselves as children, uh, pictures of themselves as children. But if you do, get some pictures of you little, like baby to four, four or five. And just look at the pictures. And just, just spend some time. that Make that a meditation, just you looking at the picture for a while. Almost like I'm, I'm sure some of you have done or heard of doing mirror work, where you just sit and look in a, in a mirror. Maybe you say loving things or you say I love you. Or you just sit and look and see what what emerges. Same thing with looking at a picture of you as an inner child. And what tends to happen for most people is it start, you start to drop into your heart. You start to feel something. You might have memories. You might have sadness come forward. You might have compassion. Um, some people, because of trauma, may be so dissociated from their inner child, it almost feels like a different person. So that's okay too. And everything's healable. But having that picture is a great way to just to to start igniting your subconscious mind and your heart that that little you exists inside of you somewhere. And it it gets you a little out of your head and into, because you're looking at a visual image and into the, the parts of your brain that really help you access the subconscious mind. So that's a really great way. Another great way, and we teach all this in our workshop, another great way is doing dominant, non-dominant handwriting. So allowing your I'm right-handed. So my right hand would be like, hi, little Christine, I'm here. Hello. And just taking my left hand and seeing if anything comes up. So that's a great way to do it. Guided meditations are another great way to do it. Um, I know for me, the first time I knew I really connected to my inner child, my, my coach Mona was taking me through a visualization and I, I was, I could see her off in a distance and she was sitting behind a tree. And I still remember the dress that she was wearing because it's a dress I remember from childhood. And I walked up to her and she just had her arms folded. 
and like you said, she was sitting against a tree and I kept walking around and she kept scooting around the tree so that I couldn't really see her. Mm-hmm. And I finally just sat down and I said, okay, I'll just wait. I'll just wait and you can come to me. And she finally emerged and she just looked at me and she said, what took you so long? And I came out of that because then my mind popped in and said, oh, you're making this up. You're just making this up. And my coach Mona said to me, like, what if you weren't? Like, what if you weren't making this up? And you, that was actually you making contact again with a part of you that feels a little abandoned and forgotten. And so that was really the beginning of my work for me. And I had a daily practice of looking at that picture of me as a little one. There was another one I used frequently and checking in, like, what do you need? Because there was, you know, so much of my journey was going from, you know, a high overachiever compensating for massive insecurity by achieving living in my head, being busy all the time, total neck up, disconnected from my body. Um, And that lone wolf, like I got to prove it, I got to do it type of attitude. And I completely neglected my inner child because I didn't really want to connect with her because that's where all the hurt was. You know, some people are very reluctant to connect with their inner child because They don't want all the trauma and the hurt and the memories to come forward. So I do want to say it's a thousand percent possible. And I recommend it to do inner child work without re-traumatizing yourself. The purpose of inner child work is not going back and reliving your trauma. I would never take someone back into their trauma if I was doing inner child work with them. It's more giving the inner child the, the opportunity to feel and express what they never got to express around it. And that's where really the healing and the magic happens. But I will say it does take time. These parts of us that are, there's a a great modality called IFS, Internal Family Systems. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but in that modality, yeah, yeah, it's all about parts parts work. And as humans, we're, we're naturally multiple parts, not multiple personalities. That's a very different, that's a diagnosis. It's a very different thing. But in IFS, you know, we're, we're all these different parts. Like I'm sure a lot of you can relate to trying to make a decision and going, well, a part of me wants to go and a part of me doesn't, or a part of me like is really excited about moving forward towards this business, but a part of me is scared. You know? All um, the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I that, all right? the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the, the, and I relate to that. So the, the wounded inner child part in parts work in IFS is often called the exile. And so the exile is this very wounded inner child who is just kind of so hidden back there in the subconscious that we don't even like realize how much they're, they're hurt and how much they're impacting their life. And in front of them are these protector parts that are doing a great job of protecting that inner child. So let me, I won't get too deep into parts work, but I'll just give an example because I think this will make sense for a lot of people. So, um, Let's say you have a part that, let's say you sabotage, right? Or or let's do this. Let's say you procrastinate because that's what a lot of people can relate to. You procrastinate and your rational mind goes, well, why do I procrastinate? This is so stupid. I get in my own way. Like I know there's a deadline. I know this is there for me, but I just don't do it. Like I'm not doing the things that I want to be doing. And they try to get rid of this procrastination part of them. What they don't realize is the procrastinator part, its highest intention is to keep you from putting yourself out there and getting hurt, right? Because if I don't do anything, then I'm safe. So they're the protector of this inner child who at one point did something or said something or had an idea and got hurt some way or mentally, emotionally, physically, somehow thought it is not a good idea for me to put myself out there. It's not a good idea for me to follow my own dreams And so it's like, okay, well, I got to protect myself somehow. So this protector parts emerges and it's like, well, I'm just going to slow everything down. We're just going to like really not do, we're going to talk about things, but then we're just not going to really ever do them because then we'll stay safe. So another aspect we want to be aware of when we're working with the inner child is we have these protective parts, the procrastinator, the people pleaser, the inner critic, the saboteur, like all these parts that are there that we're constantly trying to get rid of, but actually they have good intention and they're working to protect our inner child. So a beautiful result of inner child work 
is that these protector parts that like our adult self can go, okay, this is not really helping my life, having this people pleaser or saboteur or procrastinator and a critic. The, the rational adult can see that. But again, to the subconscious mind, these are very valuable parts because they protect us. But when we do that inner child work and we free that inner child from its exiled place, then these protective parts can go, oh, okay. Like I don't have to do this anymore because like the child is safe now. Do that all make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a great example. And I think procrastination is one we can all relate to as well. So I can really see, um, yeah, just how we're buffered behind a defense mechanism that would have, like you said, dropped in early childhood um, in order so that we could not, yeah, just not experience something that didn't feel right for us to experience at the time. And then we've sort of locked that in as a pattern and just perpetuated the original sort of um behavior that's helped us not feel the way we don't want to feel back into adulthood on a continuing basis which yeah is holding us back now it's interesting i'm really curious about internal family systems because it's the second time it's come up in a podcast and it seems very deep and very rich um but i'm also conscientious of like a question that i've got to ask is you've been doing this for more than 20 years now. <laughs> it's been, you've been going at it for a while. You're not coach. quite 20 yet. Not quite, don't make me older than I am. Not quite 20 yet. 20 next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I won't. Okay. Okay. Soon, <laughs> soon, soon enough. <laughs> Sorry. My math will add up eventually. Um, you've, you've, um, you've been doing this for long enough. Mm -hmm. but when and 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 when people come to coaching they ha they harbor this intention of generally a future orientation yeah is what i find it's hey i'm i want to do this and i want to achieve that and i'm going to get a coach and this is you know this is what's you know and so people are usually inspired it's like you know just if i break it down to a, a model that anybody could understand um touch wood it's like hey i want to you know win a gold medal at the olympics I say, all right cool get yourself a swimming coach boom now you've got a coach you've got an outcome you've got a coach guiding you there the place I'm coming from in my line of questioning it's a bit open and it's going to be a bit vague but I'd love for you to just expand upon it for me is yeah a lot of what we've discussed today thus far is about going back mm -hmm. and I know your podcast is called get over it get on with it <laughs> <laughs> and the get on with it I think is what pulls a lot of people into seeking out a coach mm -hmm. How did you come to realize that getting over it is actually so important? And we've discussed why getting over things is so important, but the relationship with getting over it in order to get on with it, can you expand upon that? Sure, sure. Um, so both in my professional work and my personal experience, I have found you will keep hitting the same roadblock moving forward until you go back and clear the past. It, it's just over, it just perpetuates because like the entelechy of an acorn is to become an oak tree, right? The entelechy of the human is to evolve as a soul. And so if we look at life like a big school, our, our, our higher self, the universe, our subconscious mind all collaborate to make sure we evolve. And Evolution isn't about just living through really hard things and then going achieving and achieving some goal. Evolution is about like having these challenges and healing from them, really asking, what did I learn from them? Not carrying around the trauma and the beliefs and the anger and all of that because human beings, we, we aren't super great at just letting stuff go. You know, it's not like a car accident happens and, you know, we get injured and then we're just, we, the next day we're fine. You know, the physical body is a metaphor for the emotional, spiritual, and mental body as well. There's injuries that happen to us and time does not heal all wounds. It's one of my least favorite things people say, time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. No, it does not. It just makes them deeper unless you deal with it now. There is a Hmm? Aries them, sorry. 
Oh, buries them. Yes, yes, totally, completely. And distance can make us forget, but often what it does is it makes us shut down and numb. You know, somebody can say, oh, well, that was 20 years ago that my father passed away. But if they never dealt with the grief of it, it's more that they've just shut down their heart and they've shut down their emotions. And so I would suspect that somebody that never processed the death of a parent when they were 10 years old, let's say, probably is guarded in their life and has a hard time really letting love and people in because they're afraid of loss. So this this notion that we can achieve a future goal without having, again, I'm going to use the word reverence and honor and understanding of our past, to me, just doesn't make sense. And one of the reasons I'm a coach, but also like, I, I, I'm a coach slash spiritual psychologist. So I started out as a coach and then I was like, I cannot help people unless I really start to understand psychology. Unless I can help people with their past, I'm going to get nowhere with people because I just kept seeing that, you know, you can set all the future goals you want, but you're going to get in your own way. <laughs> you're going to stumble over the same roadblock, like I said. So that's why I bring I also so jump much- in there for just a sec. Sorry, yeah, I keep interrupting you, but also- okay. I notice we sometimes set goals having coached like over 260 people myself now one-on-one like quite deeply on year-long journeys having witnessed people set goals that are coming from a place of like woundedness like like we also set goals that are just trying to fill a void yeah, sorry, I just wanted to sort of throw that in there no, as well. No, you, you hit the nail on the head there because it's the, the place that we – so there's a difference between like true inspiration and longing and motivation and wanting because for mm-hmm. me, motivation is a pushing energy. It's like let me push myself towards something I think will make me happy or inspiration fire, like in spirit, it comes from inside. It's, it's a pulling energy. It pulls us towards something where motivation is like pushing us away from something. I don't like feeling not good in my body. So I'm going to push myself to the gym. You know, I don't like being single. So I'm going to push myself onto a dating app versus inspired as, oh my gosh, like I'm in this amazing human body and I want to like enjoy it. So I'm going to go find a movement that just makes me feel alive in my body, completely different come from. And so when we set goals from the place of like you're saying, lack or or void, I mean, I'm a perfect example of that. So terribly insecure, guys I like never like me, didn't have friends, late bloomer, blah, 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 turned into super high achiever. So I was like, well, if no one likes me and I don't fit in, I'm just going to be a high achiever. And so I had my first career was in Hollywood. And which is the land of insecure people with something to prove. So I fit right in and I was, I worked my way up and I had this very successful career. But when your goals are driven and created from a place of lack, enough is never enough. Nothing ever fills it. And you achieve one thing and it's like, great. Oh, great. I still feel the same way. Okay, I'll go achieve something else. And you just keep setting the bar and keep trying to achieve this next goal. And it's all compensatory. It's all compensatory. And you never really know if you're actually going after what you want. When I quit my career in Hollywood, luckily I was with my coach Mona at the time. And I went into her one time and I'm like, why am I an agent? I hate, I hate sales. I hate that. I don't like this business. Like, why am I doing this? And she's like, are you done trying to prove something? And I said, yes, I don't want to do this. And she's like, great, then quit. And I'm like, I said, but I don't know what I want. She's like, so you're going to wait until you know what you want, until you quit a job you hate? That doesn't make any sense to me. And I was like, but what about the money? And she's like, "Ah, ah, 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 ah." where does security come from? Somebody else's bank? Or do you create it for yourself? I was like, I create it for myself. (laughs) But I still didn't. (laughs) It wasn't embodied yet. But luckily, you know, I saw her every day for well, not every day, every week for 14 years. And she trained me and she was just a blessing in my life. Um, I say was because she's, she's passed over. Uh, but that, having that person, and this is what a great coach does, like 
a great coach won't push us into going and achieving goals that are compensatory. A good coach will question the goals we're pursuing and why we're pursuing them and also challenge us when we're waiting not to be scared to do something. Because in my experience, if I waited to be scared, waited to be not scared or waited to have no fear before making any changes, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. We have yeah, to. I was going to say. Yeah, we have to. We have to be scared and move forward anyway, you know? I'm really glad I asked that question. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, picking up where we were before, you mentioned that um, how to access the inner child, I guess, from here. And having also picked up on how important it is for our future self um, and, I guess, ultimately our present self. Your day-to-day relationship with your inner child, I guess the question is more around nurturing the relationship with the inner child. Um, How does that look like? Um, You mentioned having a photograph, you know, having the conversation, right hand, left hand. Um, But yeah, on a day-to-day basis, um, is it a daily thing? Is it a weekly check-in? Like, how do you continue to cultivate the relationship with your inner child? Yeah. I think it depends on where you are in your journey. So if you're just starting... Um, A daily practice is great because you really want to show that child that you're there. You know, like, for for instance, we have a a new nanny starting um, today, actually. And, like, she's got to show up day after day after day before my daughter's really going to be comfortable with her. So, like, the first three days that she was there, I was there all day, too. You know, we had to kind of have her keep showing up, showing up, showing up. And if she shows up more and more and more and more and more, then my daughter's really going to just feel comfortable and safe with her completely. So that when I leave, you know, there's no crying and she's going to understand that this is a safe person. Our inner child is no different. You would never expect to pop into a child's life, like a two-year-old or four-year-old or even a 10-year-old or 14-year-old, like one day in May, not see them again until November and expect that child to be like, oh my gosh, I've been thinking about you. I trust you completely. Like it's only been months and months and months, but hey, you're back. That's all that matters. We would never, we would never think that. So we want that consistency, especially in the beginning. Now, once the relationships established and a lot of those exile parts aren't exiled anymore, and we have that strong connection. Like for me today, like I can just do my hand on heart, my hand on belly, close my eyes and check in and just see what little Christine needs. Now I will say. For all the moms out there and parents in general, um, and especially the moms and new moms, because let's just face it, like when a kid's little, it's a little more on the mom, you know, because we're just so connected mm-hmm. with the baby. And you guys share a nervous system, I swear. <laughs> we, we, do, we really do. We do. I mean, actually, um, a child doesn't learn how to really regulate their own nervous system until they're seven. So pretty much up until the age of seven, your the mother especially is regulating the kid's nervous system, which is why most people in the postpartum world say a woman doesn't actually completely recover from having a child and get her whole body and feel back until the child is seven. So this whole like six weeks or three months or even one year thing is complete baloney. But that's another podcast. Back to this topic. <laughs> um, <laughs> One thing that I have found with my inner child, when I checked in with her, probably maybe Athena, my daughter was six months, is she was like, don't forget about me. You know, you're doing, you're taking such good care of this baby, you know, my daughter, but like, don't forget about me too. And I think as parents, especially mothers, especially with young kids, we're so focused on our actual children that we often neglect the inner child. Um, and it's so, so, so important that our inner child feels parented because if it doesn't, then the tendency, tendency to slip into familial patterns and do things our parents did or did not do for us or to us, the, the tendency of that is higher because we're not actually parenting our own inner child. I'm going to use that to even leverage a point that one of the biggest things I've noticed, thank you so much for sharing that, is it also 
parenting's all a modeling game <laughs> i've started to realize um not like inauthentically but authentically you doing your work is vital because we said like you know they pick up on how your nervous system is being regulated in their presence and i can just draw the parallels as you as you just shared what you shared and how important it is i love the way you described that i wish i had that awareness earlier um of just yeah keeping your connection to your inner child front and as front and center as possible as you're also nurturing your own child because then they will also pick up on that that connection that wholeness of that connection within yourself drives and then models out for them in the way that they can grow up safe yeah. all well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. more whole, whole well. Yeah. <laughs> well, whole word makes sense. We have, it's amazing how much incorrect grammar and made up words also make sense. So it's all good. Mm. Um, I do want to say one thing about the the frequency of checking in with the inner child. So it's off, also based on, you know, what's coming up. Um, so for example, if your reaction to something doesn't really match the circumstances, then you might want to check in and be like, hmm, what's triggered in here? Like what's really going on? Um, if you are in a relationship and you're like really frustrated with your partner and you feel like you're not getting what you need and you're really angry and you might kind of want to check in and be like, what is this reminding me of? You know, what, what could be going on here? Um, my, my husband and I do a lot of relationship work as well. And one of the most common questions we get is about polarity and something we hear often from women is like, I'm too much in my masculine or my husband's too much in, or my partner's too much in their feminine. And sometimes that's true. But most often my response to that is actually, this isn't about polarity at all. This is about two wounded inner children. Your partner isn't actually too much in his feminine. He is shutting down and going into a wounded inner child who's retreating. And it's looking like he's being um, a pleaser or whatever, but actually that's a coping strategy. And you're not too much in your masculine, your trauma response is triggered and you're actually being hypervigilant right now because you've learned that if you just manage everything and control everything, that's what keeps you safe. So it's not masculine energy, it's wounded child energy that's presenting as hypervigilance. And so, so much of even how we show up in relationship is impacted by what's going on with the inner child. That is beyond profound. Yeah, thank you so much for explaining that. And that is, um, yeah, that feels like a whole nother podcast on itself as well. Yeah, it is. Dynamics. <laughs> again, but it's also amazing to, again, come home to the fact that the the case in point being that again and again, I just always annoys me somewhat. I will say that it's it's, it's not it's a it's like a loving annoyance. It's like my my whole thing around my relationship with others from what I've learned doing this podcast is comes back to my relationship with myself. <laughs> you know? and it's, 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 it's like this loving annoyance thing. It's like, okay, yeah. that's, that's within me. <laughs> it's, <all made. laughs> it's, 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 it's liberating and annoying all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you can affirm me and relate because one of your biggest medicine is helping people be seen and be heard. So I have to, <laughs> I have to acknowledge that as well. I love your podcast. You're coaching people live. You're running a retreat soon. Um, you mentioned you do women's retreats now. Is there one coming up soon, Sean? Yeah, I, I do. Well, I do a bunch of different live events, but one of the things that I love and is so close to my heart is my signature women's retreat. Um, I've been doing it for, gosh, how long? Over over a decade. And it started out as like 10 people in a little house. And now it's usually around 100 people at a beautiful place. And um you know, a big part of my journey was really learning what being feminine means and what being a woman means. And there was so much confusion about feminine energy. And, and especially as a um, ambitious, driven woman, I didn't relate to my stereotype of what I saw feminine energy as. I didn't relate to like this flowy, like blow with the wind, making my own granola and gardening in the back and moon ceremonies. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But in my judgmental, uneducated, stereotypical mind, that's what feminine energy looked like to me. And that didn't look very powerful to me. 
And I really had to sit with that. I'm like, why am I avoiding? Like, what am I afraid of? Why am I so judgmental of feminine energy? And what, what it occurred to me is like, I had the misunderstanding that it wasn't powerful. I thought that being more in that doing, driving energy was what was powerful. But then when I got really clear with myself, I'm like, oh, wait, that's just my trauma response. Hypervigilance and doing is my trauma response. So I don't even know what masculine and feminine means at all. I've got to get really clear about this. And this was, this was years ago, probably 15 years ago. And I just made it my mission to really understand what feminine energy really was and what being a woman really included. And, and um, this women's retreat, it's a combination of things that I've experienced and learned from great teachers and just things I've created and um, come up with along the journey. And it's a highly feminine retreat. And what I mean by that is I've been to so many beautiful personal development workshops where it is more masculine. It's chanting and it's giving neck rubs and it's listening to loud music and it's clapping mm. and it's like motivating people. And it's a lot of doing. It's a lot of doing and it's a lot of masculine energy. And so my women's retreat is all about, and as I'm talking about this retreat, I'm also teaching about masculine feminine energy so people can like get a concept of what the difference is in, in our own life and how it presents in the world. And again, there's nothing wrong with that more masculine way of doing things, but we also need to balance that out with the feminine, right? Because there's, there's definitely an imbalance. I mean, we can see imbalances in our world all over the place. Again, another podcast. So this retreat was a way to create personal transformation in the feminine way that you actually can have mind-blowing, life-altering change with being loved, with being supportive, with surrendering, with receiving, with being in your body, and without really doing anything. And so this highly experiential retreat is a lot of processes and uh, journeys that culminate in really stepping into total freedom and really knowing who you are as a woman and what being feminine really is. Um, one of the things, and I'll, I'll, this is the last thing I'll say about it, unless you have questions. So one of the things that um, I've noticed being a woman and working with so many women, and I work with lots of men too, but specifically this retreats for women, is that women really are not in touch with our anger at all. And it leaks out in all kinds of ways. It leaks out by being irritable bitchy, controlling, not connected to our passion, both our passion in terms of our expression in the world and our passion in terms of our sensuality and sexuality, and um, not being healthy either because anger is a hot energy. And if we hold it inside, it can manifest in health things. And so one of the things that the retreat is I really teach women how to do emotional release, not cathartic emotional expression, because there's so much out there in the personal growth world that's like, rah, and like a cathartic release, which is great. It feels yeah, good. It be mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't move things. There's a way to bash a pillow that actually is emotional release, but it's not just rah, rah, going up to a pillow and hitting it. Like there's a whole thing that needs to happen around that. So one of the things that I'm super passionate about is helping women really learn about their rage and their anger and learn how to express that and channel that because underneath that is their power and their fire and their passion and their health and their freedom. So that's just one of the things that you get at the retreat, but it's, it's a unique offering because it was a um, quick backstory. I was put on antidepressants when I was 11 and I got off of them. It took me two years. I got off of them like between 29 and 30 ish. And um, it was a whole journey for me to get off of them. And a huge piece of being able to get off antidepressants is learning how to release, feel and release my emotions in a healthy way. And I actually didn't need antidepressants. I needed, how to, I needed to learn how as a very empathic, highly sensitive being, how to not suppress my feelings because my depression was a result of suppression and depression, not an actual chemical mm -hmm. imbalance. Now that said, for some people, it may be that and I'm not an anti-medication person, that was just, I had to tune into what was right for me, you know, so. It's your truth, yeah. Yeah, to my own truth. So the retreat, um, it's actually coming up in San Diego, October 13th through 15th, 
it's not too late to join us. Um, and it's, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out, but it is truly life-changing. Yeah. I'll put a link to the retreat and your podcast in the show notes below. Oh, Christine, <laughs> thank you so much for just, yeah, this yummy hour of helping us connect back into, I guess, ultimately what holds us back from living a life that we most desire. Um, I think it's it's really, for me, context is always king in philosophy, I find. And just, yeah, the context that you carry of, you know, having been a coach for so long and yet we could have talked about anything and yet what we're talking about is all the inner wounds that, you know, are just waiting for you to say, hey, here's my inner child and, you know, building a relationship and cultivating that so we can actually heal from such a deep place so that we can get on with it in a really beautiful way is not lost on me um, that we had a therapy related conversation when really the context that you carry is forward oriented with coaching. So I could thank you for today's conversation, but I don't think that's going to do it justice. <laughs> it's a life's no. worth, lifetime's worth of work that you put into all of this. <laughs> so thank you for you um, showing up, always doing the work on yourself. Thank you to Mona. Mm, yes. Bless her. Mm-hmm rest in peace and uh yeah thank you so much for just continuing to just support so many people on their path and their journey and myself included here today thank you oh well you're welcome and i acknowledge you because you shared with me before we started recording you know you made a big change and you didn't just talk about the life that you wanted or compare yourself to other people you looked at it more as aspirational inspirational versus this they have something that i don't you know jealousy and inspiration there can be a fine line between the two. You know, we can look and be jealous or compare and, you know, think that we can't have something or we can really look and see that like positive projection is everywhere. You know, you spot it, you got it. And you were able to spot something. You were able to spot that people, like people doing what they love, people really living in their IntelliKey, right? Because I believe that we all have that. We all have our own IntelliKey, whatever that is. Um, And it can be quite scary to say yes to that because especially our societal conditioning is more about be safe, be secure, don't take risks, you know? And so to be able to overcome that programming and go out and create something that is more in alignment with what you want, that takes great courage. So I acknowledge you for that and thank you for that because the more we see people doing that, the more that becomes the norm. Mm-hmm. Touch wood. That is the inspired evolution. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Guys, if you love this podcast with Christine Hassler, thank you so much for listening all the way through to the end. This is the very next best episode with Matt Khan on inner child healing. This is a complete masterclass. Matt is a guru when it comes to inner child healing as well. So to continue this inner child healing conversation, tune in to this episode with Matt, which is deeply profound. Now.